Hello and welcome to 81 All Out. This is your host, Siddhartha Vaidyanathan. And I would like to thank you for taking the time out to listen to this podcast. We are a crowdfunded endeavor and you can support us at coffee.com. That's K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash 81 All Out to keep the show going. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the 81 All Out podcast. Today we have a very special episode and I'm thrilled to introduce uh, the guest today, my friend. And uh, as I was telling him just before the recording, the Don Corleone of uh, the internet, uh, Prem Panikar. Hello, Prem. Welcome to the show. <laughs> hey, Sid. Um, I'll try and do my best, Marlon Brando, but... Uh... No, seriously, I mean, uh, you introduced me as a friend and I'm grateful. We've been, um, I've been an admirer of your work from your Crick and Four Days. And 81 All Out is one of those podcasts that, uh, yeah, still a cricket fan occasionally lapsing, but uh, it's the one I follow. So, I'm okay, okay, wonderful. That. And talking about, uh, you know, the following <laughs> your work, uh, I must tell listeners that, uh, you know, back in the late 90s, I was uh, still in high school at that time and, uh, you know, we didn't, we had a very dodgy internet connection. So every time I used to go to uh, readif.com and try and read the cricket reports, my internet invariably used to hang. Uh, this is not an indictment on readif, by the way. This is an indictment on my care, modem connection, which used to the uh, dial-up modem. And so I used to tell my dad, whenever he used to go to work, because he had a good connection there, I used to tell him to go and print out all these reports that uh, Prem used to write. So he used to get it all in the evening. And uh, I remember, you know, sitting, when, when the moment my dad came back, it was almost like, you know, the ma- goodies had come home and I used to give me the reports and I used to sit for the next one hour and happily, la- la- you know, lap up everything. So Prem, uh, thank you for that, for the post-school entertainment and uh, enrichness that you gave me. Yeah, I suppose part of the reason why it was lagging was because the bloody reports are so long, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know yeah. you were those days that was a thrill for me because you know i used to read the newspaper reports and magazine reports that all had word limits and then yeah. this was a whole new world that opened up to me to see like 3000 4000 words of writing on a cricket match day um, it was brilliant but prem let's uh, begin so this chat uh, i would love to chat with prem about uh, cricket and technology that that's how broad i've kept this topic but I feel Prem is a great person to talk about this because he's been, he's had a ringside view uh, through and through, um, you know, right, uh, growing up, uh, I guess he would have uh, uh, consumed a lot of the game through the radio and through print. And then, of course, he would have seen the television boom and the television era. And he was at the forefront of the internet era. And then ever since then, even over the last 15 years, he's been, um, you know, he's uh, uh, dabbled with so much of, so he's, he's of course, uh, uh, in, on social media uh, big time, but he's also dabbled in a lot of other technology and he's understood technology uh, considerably well. So Prem, take, a, take us a bit back to, you know, uh, slightly younger days and uh, introduction to cricket. Was radio a big deal back then or was print bigger? Uh, it, it it was a mix of uh, pretty much everything. Said um, radio was big, yes. Uh, print. I remember back then when there was a test match in the offing, you would have about three to four pages dedicated to uh, cricket alone. And this was not just uh, uh, it was not just the Hindu, which which gave a lot of space to cricket, even in Indian Express. You would have things like before the start of a series, for instance, you would have uh, a three pages of uh, player profiles, two of those pages obviously being about the Indian players and then um, one page would be whoever we were playing against. Uh, Radio, obviously. Ironically, I actually saw a test match live uh, before I followed a test match on radio. Um, I think I was about 11 at the time, 1969. Um, This was uh, December. Uh, Australia was playing India at, at Chennai. Um, so you had a lot of the great players, Chapel, Laurie, Walters, uh, there was uh, Paul Sheehan, 
uh, Ian Redpath. Ian Redpath. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Garth McKenzie uh, played in that series. Ashley Mallet, um, mm. whose return catches used to be uh, incredible. And um, India had, uh, uh, Gavaskar hadn't entered uh, the arena yet. So it was Chauhan and Mankan. Uh, you had Vadeka, Vishwanath, engineer, um, Patawdi, who uh, was dropped earlier in that series and then brought back. Uh, you had Solka. You had Amarnath batting somewhere as far below. He, he, he was at that time seen as a bowler who could bat a little bit, uh, an opening bowler, which was, which was the standard of a pace attack at that time, if you like. Um, he was batting. And that was also Vishwanath's debut, right? Debut series. Co- correct, yes. Um, Am- Amanath was batting at about eight or nine, if I remember, and uh, Venkat played. So for the Chennai boys, it was a big thing. What what what, what used to happen back then was uh, talking of technology. There was this thing where you could go to any phone, even a phone booth, and just dial a toll free number, and a voice would read out the latest score for you. Um, how this worked was that next to the commentators booth, there was this room where. Uh, there were a dozen operators manning two dozen phones, which would keep ringing. And uh, the operator picked up the phone and read off from the scoreboard. Uh, Mom at that time was a mid-level official uh, in the telephones department. And uh, she was given the supervisory duty. So it, it, it was quite cool. Best seat in the house. Uh, all you had to do was watch the cricket. There's nothing to supervise really, right? And unless the line goes down and she has to call uh, GSQ and get it fixed or something. Yeah. So she managed to smuggle me into the stadium. And uh, that's how I sat and watched uh, uh, that entire series. Of course, there were a lot of caveats. I had to do well in my half yearly and all of that. But yeah, I managed. And then uh, there was the 1971 tour of the West Indies, which introduced me to radio, um, which was kind of, uh, again, when you look back on it, uh, you realize that following a game on radio made it somehow far more precious. Uh, we had this old uh, radio called UMS. Uh, the brand was UMS, Wolf Radios, they called them at the time. Uh, okay. They'd have a wire sticking out of the back and you somehow uh, went to the top of the tree and tied it up there, hoping that the reception would be better. It never was. And my uncle, my father's younger brother, who was staying with us at that time, uh, he accidentally figured out that if you took another wire from the same place where the aerial was connected to the radio and you held it between your fingers, the reception improved. Uh, I don't know what the science behind that is. but So I got the duty of holding on to this damn thing all day, um, which can cramp your fingers. So I learned to tie it around my finger. And what used to happen was that dad and uh, my uncle and mom would go to work, except for Saturday, Sunday, when when uh, they were at home. And uh, I had to maintain a scoreboard because they didn't want to wait for the next day. Um, so I'd sit in front of the radio throughout uh, the course of the match and uh, meticulously uh, score the match. So you had to mark the fours and the sixes and uh, all of them at home were cricket fans. So it wasn't enough for the scoreboard. They would ask, how was the shot played? And and I would demonstrate a, a Gavaskar straight drive oh, as wow. if I'd seen, yeah, as if I'd seen it. So I had this uh, little bat at that time and, and I, I don't know if they were indulging me or whatever, but they would ask, so, so how did he hit that four? And, and I would say, oh, you know, he came down the wicket and, and his bat was dead straight. You're listening to the radio, right? And, and uh, <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Anand Setalwad and uh, Berry Sarbadikari, people like that. And uh, I think I think in an odd kind of way, that is when I learned to make notes when watching a match because I knew that uh, they would want granular detail. So every now and again, I would scribble down something or the other um, about how, um, say, for instance, uh, somebody had, had uh, bowled to Gavaskar and how Gavaskar had played and uh, about the Sardesai Solkar uh, stands, they would, if you remember, uh, Solkar would would play these very uh, gritty uh, back of the order innings. So, yeah, that 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 was that was brilliant because you absorbed cricket in a in such a 
uh, granular way that you don't know. Even when you're watching cricket, there are 10 other things happening, WhatsApp messages coming in or, you know, something going on on Twitter or whatever. Here it was nothing. It is just the voice in your head telling you what is going on. And uh, yeah, yeah, and I one of the things that uh, you know, uh, it's uh, that uh, struck me when you started off talking about your gr- growing up was the you spoke about the team. You said sixty nine Australia, and then you listed the names. You know, you said Gavaskar, Mankad, they, uh, not yeah. Gavaskar before Gavaskar. Uh, you you listed the team, and I've noticed that uh, people like uh, people. Uh, of my age and people of an older age, it's a very common thing among us who to say, you know, I mean, if you talk about the West, great West Indies team, you just automatically start the lineup. Haynes, Greenwich, yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. uh, Richards. Yeah. But I wonder if, I don't know if uh, that kind of a, a memory and rhythm and conversation happens now and whether lineups stick so vividly as they used to before. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the second match that I watched live uh, in the stands, by then I had graduated to the school stands because uh, those days schools had these quotas. Um, you could get tickets. And yeah. I didn't want to sit with mom um, in that box when I could be with my peers yelling and screaming and all of that. And I remember, I think I remember the entire uh, lineup. It was uh, Fredericks, Greenwich, Kalicharan, Richards, mm-hmm. Lloyd, uh, there was Derek Murray, um, Bernard Julian, uh, Van Burn Holder, uh, Andy Roberts, Lance Gibbs. Oh, wow. <laughs> and in India was, this was the Pungal test, right? I mean, yeah. famous in Chennai. Uh, India had engineer Solkar, Gaikwad, uh, Pataudi, who, who had by then been reinstated as captain. Uh, there was Mankad, Madanlal, Gavri, um, and the three spinners, of course, uh, uh, Chandra, Bedi, and Prasanna. So, uh, yeah, and, and and I remember Roberts taking a 7-4 in the first innings and 5-4 in the second. All of this I remember distinctly. But if you ask me uh, the lineup and the, the top performers of the previous test that we just played, <laughs> uh, I have to look at the scoreboard. So yeah, right. It, it, I, I suppose it's a, it's a measure of how much we treasured these moments at that time and how fleeting uh, our involvement with the game is. We, we were completely involved when it's happening, but a moment later, ten other things happen that submerges our memories. I guess. Yeah, I wonder if uh, twenty years or thirty years down the line, if um, you know, kids today will remember, say, the GABA test with as granular a detail. I would hope they would, but, uh, you know, time will only tell me. I mean, maybe I could ask people who grew up in the 2000s, you know, to uh, about that. But uh, coming to, uh, you know, uh, gradually moving on from uh, that to television, I guess mm-hmm. uh, television would have been uh, a huge leap for uh, India of that time and for generally to to suddenly see all these players come to life on your screen. Yeah, true. Uh, I remember we got uh, television for the first time because the 82 Football World Cup was going to be uh, televised. Uh And uh, uh, it's funny, I mean, uh, back home in Calicut, my other uncles and all that are huge football fans. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dad wasn't particularly, but somehow this whole thing of television, it's coming in color, all of that. Um, so we got this color TV and uh, that is when we started watching. And then, of course, there was 83 and everything else that happened. And yeah, it was a different experience. I mean, you processed it initially through your ears, right? I mean, you you heard the commentators talk about how uh, it was played and, and, and it created images in your head. And then suddenly to actually see that, I, I suppose it had its good side and bad side because the good side was... You got to see. You didn't. You didn't need the commentary anymore. Uh, the bad side was you realized that a lot of the commentary that you heard was probably completely off point, because uh, the guy guy would talk about a drive and all that, and what you were seeing was a sort of airy fairy edge uh, going through wherever it was. Uh, there was a disconnect. But but yeah, uh, watching players for the first time uh, that was amazing. Um, and and I think that is where you started understanding the game a bit more. I mean, for all the uh, 
description that you can get, you kind of made it up, right? I mean, you were learning cricket at that time, and and so when somebody says cover drive, okay, you have a, you have a vague picture, but you don't realize the nuances. Um, there's a huge difference between, say, uh, uh, Mohammad Azuruddin playing a cover drive and Sachin Tendulkar playing a cover drive and um, uh, VVS Lakshman playing a cover drive, or Dilip playing soccer. Uh, through the years, a cover drive is a cover drive. Once you see it, it becomes, you start uh, seeing the nuances. I was thinking of what you used to do first in Crick Info and then on your own blog and all that, where you would take one stroke or one moment and write about it. Yeah, I don't suppose that was possible. I, it wouldn't have been possible back in the day when all you had to rely on was the radio, because yeah, I mean that really... then you would have had to be a large fictional component there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I have no idea of all those cover drives that I demonstrated for my parents and <laughs> uncle. <laughs> Anything to do with reality, but hell, that's 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 what it was I guess. yeah i mean i guess someone like neville cardis who you know hmm. is the doyen of cricket writing uh, it also helped that he uh, wrote about cricket at a time when hardly anyone saw it so because yeah, a lot of his uh, you know uh, larger than life characterizations and his embellishments he yeah. could get away with partly because of that i mean in the, this day and age i'm sure there would be people on twitter pointing out the 15 errors that he's made in his writing absolutely and even before social media came along if you remember we used to have uh, cricket info also used to do this uh, in your time where uh, people could comment yeah uh, and and uh, the comments would be what the hell are you talking about that's not what yeah. happened you know Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, when we used to do ball by ball commentary, and I'm sure you you too have noticed this. I mean, the, you just make like one minor mistake, and within ten, 10 seconds, people tell you about it. <laughs> yeah, and they tell you in no uncertain terms. It's like, you know, what the hell are you doing? Uh, one of the most common uh, comments I used to get is, uh, who the hell are you to write about all this? You know, why don't you stick to politics or whatever? So, <laughs> And, and, and now I, and now you people are telling you to stick to cricket. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now if I say something about politics, it's like just go back to cricket. You don't know anything, <laughs> anything about what you're talking about. So, so yeah, this 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 whole thing of instantaneous feedback and all of that that came uh, later. I think it was a quieter time. You could you could sort of uh, marinate in the cricket without all this noise and and it helped that I wasn't doing cricket at the time, right? So I was just I was just a fan. And uh, there's a huge difference between watching as a fan and watching because you have to or because you have to write a report or whatever. Uh, yeah, and uh, what struck me when you said about, uh, you know, watching uh, the first experience of television being the 1982 uh, Football World Cup. I mean, that you got the peakest of the peakest of the most beautiful team to watch as your first oh, yes. television experience yeah. with the Brazilian team. <laughs> Yeah, I remember uh, when I was in Yahoo much later, uh, just before the World Cup, uh, this was 2012, something like that, uh, I'd, I'd started writing about this whole thing, the the way television came to India and, and watching uh, Socrates and his team, uh, you know, play uh, to the samba rhythms and stuff. It was, it was mesmeric. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's this uh, book about you know, 10 games that Brazil uh, lost mm-hmm. and uh, not being able to figure out why yet. And uh, one of those games, uh, one of those reports uh, starts with this incident where Falcao, who was then a journalist, he was uh, he was covering the lead up to a, a World Cup. And he goes to, I think it was Portugal, where there was some kind of uh, practice match being played and he was pissed off because he had just been flying all over the place covering these no account matches and uh, at the immigration counter uh, the man looks at the passport looks at Falcao looks at the passport then looks back at Falcao and then he says how in the hell did you lose that match <laughs> <laughs> and you know so I, I use that as a lead in to how this this thing has haunted Brazil all its life the 82 team losing uh the World Cup. We had uh, Muda, Mudar Pateria on the podcast uh, a few uh, few months earlier, yeah. and uh, he mentioned how you know until seventy eight and eighty two, football was so huge in Calcutta that you thought that the players that you were watching were you know 
world class. And then you saw all this on television and then you realized, okay, what I'm watching is actually like 10 notches below what these yeah, guys are playing. A, yeah, there's a funny uh, thing about that though. Uh, the Sao Paulo Juniors came uh, on a trip to India. This was sometime in the, I think, late 80s. Okay. Um, and uh, India, the first, uh, they, they, they were playing five exhibition matches. And in the first match, it was, uh, I think it was in Goa or someplace. And so you had a lot of the Goan players and a couple of the internationals playing. And uh, these kids just ran circles around them. <laughs> uh, so it it started going around the country and finally it was in uh, Eden Gardens. By then, India had lost all the four games by substantial margins. So at the Eden Gardens, they had the full Indian team and these kids apparently ran circles around them. I think we lost uh, by about four goals or whatever and these guys could have made it, I, I don't know, 14 if they wanted to. <laughs> They were just 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 playing with with the Indians, and and I understand where Mudar is coming from because I used to follow these uh, games so intensely. Ooh, Habib, Akbar, you know all of those names. Mm. It also helped that one of my uncles was uh, K S uh, oh, okay. who was the Indian goalkeeper at that time. Yeah. Um. So yeah, you got to go watch matches in uh, Caligate and uh, elsewhere when when uh, teams were playing. And it is it is quite uh, stunning uh, the difference between standards. It's it's also like kind of watching. I mean, I mentioned the seventy five uh, uh, West Indies team, but before that there was the seventy three England team. Uh, Tony Dennis Lewis, Amos. right? Yeah, Tony Lewis, Dennis Amos. Uh, there was mm-hmm. Alan Knott. There was uh, Mike Dennis. Keith Fletcher was there. Mm-hmm. Um, Tony Greg was there. And that was uh, the Chennai Test was the one where. Uh, Tony Gray got so pissed off with Solker, uh, who was standing so close to him, that uh, at one point he playfully raised his bat to uh, hit him and, and get him out of uh, uh, forward short leg. And Solker, when he said forward short leg, it was actually forward short leg. The guy was standing right on, almost at the edge of the pitch. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different era. It, it meant so much. So, given the, uh, how, uh, you know, fond you were of cricket and how closely you were watching it. Uh, it but I, it doesn't seem that at any point of time you actually wanted to get into writing about it because uh, obviously you started your career as a journalist and with nothing to do with cricket, you covered politics and so many other beats. Uh, was it simply because uh, it didn't seem like a viable career then or was cricket just to, you know, uh, seemed a, t- a bit too light for someone like you who was interested in the far more serious and who is still interested in the far more serious? Uh, no, I, I mean, I got into into uh, journalism because I loved uh, telling stories. I loved the idea of going places and, and seeing what was actually there as opposed to, you know, what I was absorbing. Uh, I think the reason I didn't do cricket was probably, I never thought of it in the first place. And then there was a lot of happenstance uh, to it because, um, um, I mean, I started with Free Press, which which uh, by about six months into that, I was offered a job uh, with uh, the Indian Post when Nikhil Lakshman took over uh, that paper from Vinod Mehta. Uh, and there you had the Crasto brothers, Daryl, Ivan, the entire Crasto cousins and, and brothers yeah. and all of that doing it. So... Uh, there was no room. There was, uh, I mean, Indian Post at that time had about when 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 Nikhil took over, uh, Vinod Mehta had taken the entire staff away with him. Uh, the only staff that remained intact was the sports desk, which was headed by Sham S K Sham, mm-hmm. and uh, you had all these crastos and all that. So the it, the need never arose, and and obviously because the beat was covered. I didn't even think about it. From there, I moved to midday where Hemal Asher and Sharda Ogra uh, were heading the uh, sports desk. Yeah. And both of them are brilliant. And both of them are very intolerant of, of you know, some amateur wanting to uh, sort of get into their space. So Sharda would kind of shoo you away if you went anywhere, <laughs> near, her, uh, anywhere near her desk. So it, it just was... Uh, Thing. After that, I went to Sunday Observer, where I was doing the features magazine, uh, the magazine section. 
so again cricket didn't uh, didn't come up i i i would be editing and putting together the magazine and writing features for it and also writing features or investigative reports for the main paper but i never did cricket i think it was just uh, you know how it is when you're a professional journalist you do what is required of you it was never required and and while i was watching cricket during that period it, it, again even in sunday observer the uh, the crasto brothers were there so ah, okay. they 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 pretty much did all that needed to be done and and there was nothing for me to do absolutely yeah so talking about uh, things that are new and things that are fresh um, you know uh, i found out recently that february 1996 was the uh, first time you wrote on cricket for readers but uh, t- tell us a bit about uh, you and readif and you getting in there and also the landscape at that time with respect to the internet especially in india uh, both uh, what did really people think of it at the time and uh, was there you know this whole like any new technology were there people saying uh, oh this is just a fad nothing's going to come of it this is the big dis- distraction of our times <laughs> I don't think people saw it as a distraction so much said I think people saw it as what the hell is this all about frankly um I think the first conversation about my joining read up so Ajit Balakrishnan had uh, spoken to Nikhil Lakshman who was then my editor I mean he is the only editor I worked with so at that time we were both in the Sunday Observer and uh, Ajit had several conversations with Nikhil about this new technology that was emerging i think the conversation started around august 95 uh, when the internet was opened up for commercial mm-hmm. exploitation mm-hmm. uh and uh, i think about a month later nikhil called me uh, by then he had left sunday observer um and i was kind of holding the fort and uh, nikhil called me and said uh, there's a gentleman who wants to speak to you so i went and that's when i met uh, ajit and he told me about this uh, technology nikhil was there ajit was there uh, they told me about this technology and what their plans were it said would you want to join um around the same time vivek goenka was uh, asking me if i would join the indian express as a uh, resident editor uh for me i think the choice was dictated by the fact that you know how it is with the newspaper world uh one of the things that happens is there is a template right i mean there is a front page and then there are city pages and then there is national page and there is this and that and beyond a point in time it is more a matter of filling in the blanks uh there's nothing unknown things happen every day and you have to figure out how to cover it but once you've done that for a bit it's a, it becomes a matter of routine there is no fresh uh challenge nothing no 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 problem that you're trying to solve you just go and you do your thing you come back you do your thing all over again that sort of thing um so of the two choices uh read of thought is less uh well paid at the time than the other option that i had uh read of was attractive because this was new i, I I hadn't seen the internet before I'd uh I had no idea what it was and when Ajit tried to demonstrate it this was not during that first conversation this was after I said yes uh the modem connection was so bloody slow that I was wondering what the heck this thing is <laughs> uh it was that uh, cricket <laughs> yeah the twang kind of sound would come in and 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 nothing was happening and I was like okay what are we supposed to do with this thing in fact I, I remember in the lead up to our launch and stuff like that uh, those those early ms dos systems and stuff i just couldn't wrap my head around the damn thing so i'd be writing something and suddenly it would all vanish and the only person who knew everything was ajit right so i didn't realize that he was the publisher and the owner and the 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 uh, joint uh, uh, head of uh, rediffusion and advertising and such a big shot and all that i was like ajit can you help me i i lost track of this <laughs> and poor fellow he 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 would have to come in and and say prem this is what you're supposed to do what are you doing and <laughs> it was it is kind of in fact the original uh, template for read up was actually on pen and paper oh wow <laughs> it was not it was not on the internet yeah i mean it, it looked none of us knew the internet none of us knew what to do none of us knew what tech was uh just just coding uh a equals hf i mean a hf whatever uh, all of that 
and and realizing that if you got one little thing wrong and these were best early computers right very easy to make mistakes and very hard to spot them because there was no spell check and there was no uh, all of the modern tools and you would do all that work and and when you tried to publish nothing would come of it and then you had to go through every single character that you had typed in to see where the bloody mistake came from so it was it was kind of in a sense yeah a complete leap of faith and your point about how people viewed it i think the classic uh way of describing it is when we were trying to recruit for readers in the early days before the actual launch mm. nobody would join yeah, because they didn't know what the hell was the going on <laughs> yeah and, and they were like look we have bylines we are working for indian express and hindu and and and, and times of india and all of that and what is this damn thing uh, being done in a garage in a corner of uh, you know narman point uh, actually it was uh, fort area uh, tiny little uh, street a uh, fairly dilapidated uh, building in which we had um, a small office basically it was just one room uh, where okay. everybody sat and <laughs> in the early days we actually had this thing where there weren't enough computers to go around so wow. uh, yeah so you you kind of took turns and all of that um definitely not pandemic friendly <laughs> definitely not pandemic friendly definitely not work friendly um <laughs> uh, and 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 because we had to learn this thing while actually working on it we had gotten into the habit of actually sleeping on the floor uh two three days we would be in the office and then go home one one day because uh we didn't even have a shower in the office so when you started smelling so much that your colleagues uh, <laughs> kept pushing so then you went to the uh, went home had a shower slept for a bit and came right back i in fact i remember one late night discussion very animated discussion about whether business standard or the hindu was a better paper to sleep on and <laughs> so, wow yeah somebody was making the argument that the hindu because it was thicker ply so it gave you more insulation and it is it is madness complete madness <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but, but as when you were growing up though i'm always intrigued by the people who like you who took this leap of faith uh, you know in the mid 90s into this new era uh, were you somebody who was always you know uh, you know, who would open up the uh, transistor to figure out how, how it was working were you tech uh, did you veer towards tech uh yeah i mean opening up the transistor room but tell, i mean i told you about that ums radio and there was a time yeah. when it 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 kind of uh, conked out and you know how it is back in the day right for any purchase you have endless rounds of discussion it's like the corporate world today. you had to have presentations and budgeting <laughs> and all of that so roi <laughs> yeah so the, the the replacement radio wasn't coming and this uncle of mine and uh, i uh sat down uh one day and uh it was a, a weekend and we took the back of the radio and pulled everything out and you know we found that some of the wires had frayed and all that so we got hold of uh, new wires and we connected everything up the thing is even in those days a wire would be cut precisely and soldered into place right we didn't have soldering irons and stuff so we kind of attached it any which way we uh, knew how and and for a for a 3 inch wire we would have used a 1 foot uh, long wire and finally the whole damn thing wouldn't go back into the box so our radio for a while until we got a new one was actually this case of the ums yes and a whole lot of inuts that had spilled out because we couldn't fit it back and and so so yeah in a sense i love fiddling around with things i don't think there was until re- until readif happened until 1995 opened this thing up i wasn't that aware of tech um we had used some cutting edge technology in the indian post there was a production system called atex which was brilliant for that time and i think it's still brilliant for today mm-hmm. uh made the whole process of uh, editorial from from writing a story to editing it to actually putting it on the page you could do all that from your terminal and that was the highest tech we had um we introduced or at least uh, tarik ansari introduced computers in in midday uh, about halfway through my stint over there so yeah uh, i liked 
I think I think my initial uh, attitude towards tech was anything that made the mechanical chores of an editorial office easier. I was all for. Um, otherwise, we remember we had to uh, print out your stories on galleys and then cut them and and editing on a galley with a with a paper knife. Oh yeah, uh, taking out one word and then trying. To, yeah, all of that. It, it, this made it so simple, right? I mean, you took out a word and everything readjusted automatically. So, so yeah, I I loved tech for that reason. Absolutely, and and uh, so uh, forwarding on uh, February ninety six. How did cricket happen? Hey, uh, I told you nobody was joining. Uh, Harsha was a friend. He 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 had written for us in midday. Um, so we asked Harsha. He said, "I can write the occasional column, but I can't do match reports because I've been uh, commissioned." uh by somebody or the other to do that um and none of the cricket writers would join readif so uh there was about a week to go for the world cup and and um uh there were about i think at that time seven journalists uh some of them had were specializing in various subjects there was yazid darasha who was looking after the economic coverage and there were a couple of people for the politics part of it and uh, we had a guy called zaki ansari who was very very tech savvy i mean he's the one who who really went into the nuts and bolts of how things worked and and he became a go to resource for anything tech um i suppose i was the only one without a clear brief so they looked around and said ah, okay you played some cricket when you were a kid so <laughs> you do cricket <laughs> and next thing i know i'm i'm supposed to be covering a world cup doing match reports and i had no idea what the hell a match report was and how to do it and back in the day the rule was that a uh, rule an uh, unwritten rule uh, because of what you spoke about right the download times and all that yeah uh, i was told that the match report had to be within had to fit within one frame um that is all that would download quickly and uh, I remember the first match I'm watching I'm making notes at the end of it I'm trying to figure out how to write this report and I realized I couldn't do it in one frame so I said the hell with the rules and and I'm going to write this match report the way I think I want to write it and I just wrote and it went off into several scrolls <laughs> and uh, I published it uh, mercifully uh, the editor didn't see it before and Ajit Balakrishnan didn't see it I think they saw it after it was published, and uh, Ajit nearly had a hissy fit. He said, "I thought I told you one scroll and all of that." But what happened within a couple of match reports was that we started getting feedback from uh, the US, um, from people who were reading it and saying, uh, "This works for us. It's like actually being there and watching the game." So then I was pretty much left to my own devices, and 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 yeah, that's that's kind of how uh, uh, cricket reporting. started and uh, then it kind of evolved into ball by ball again it was it was a matter of i think listening to feedback uh, it was kind of funny in a sense because uh, initially it used to be one match report and then after a bit it was about uh, about a quarter of the way into the world cup or one third of the way into the world cup i think one of the letters that we got said uh, look we are living in a different time zone and we have to wait till we wake up to see what actually happened so is it possible to do a half time report after the first oh. innings <laughs> okay um so ajit read that mail and came to me and said uh, okay this is one feedback that we got and what do you think and i was like yeah okay lunch time i can write a report not a problem so it started with a half way report and then after a bit there was this thing of you know every hour this is the internet it's about constant refreshing remember us knew the internet yeah uh, much better than we did so we were very very uh, aware of what was coming from there in terms of feedback um i think ajit had new people in the indian associations and places like mit and harvard and stuff and he would stay in touch with them so they would constantly send feedback so i said why is there not a paragraph or so every hour and uh, so again there was this discussion and now yeah eventually what you were doing yeah. back in 1996 was basically twitter as it was in 2008 yeah. or 6 pretty much and, and and the fun part was i remember there was this uh, one tech uh, person that we had uh, called shri uh, shrikant um so we were all sitting in the same room and 
then Ajit came and told me about this uh, one hour thing. Out of exasperation, I think I just said, at this rate, these guys are going to be asking for one every other minute. <laughs> and Srikanth was completely absorbed in whatever he was doing. He just heard this out of the corner of his ear and said, turned around and said, hey, I can make a box for you and you can type whatever you want into it and hit submit and it'll go. So we were like, okay, you make the box. And the guy worked overnight and, and next day we had this box. So <laughs> it was like, okay, let's try it. And and we announced that this there was going to be live commentary. And we ran into so many problems uh, we hadn't anticipated. For one thing, the connections being as slow as they were, were then, you typed something about a particular ball. At that time, I was doing one or two uh, deliveries together at a time. Uh, very vestigial kind of ball-by-ball -ball commentary. Mm. So you type something in and you hit publish. And this thing, would, the, 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 this little round thing would just go round and round on your uh, computer. And those browsers didn't have multiple windows. You had to open a fresh iteration of the browser. So you open a fresh one and type the next thing in. And the first one would still be going round and round. And through some quirk, the second one would go off uh, into, into the uh, web. And the first one wouldn't have gone. So it <laughs> became a jumble. And, and, and yeah, it, 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 it was until things kind of settled down and you had reliable connections and stuff. Uh, it was insane. Um, I remember back in the day, uh, Srikanth excitedly coming and telling me, your problems are over, your computer will work damn fast because we have this new uh, chip or whatever I'm going to put into it. It's got 546 Mbps or something. And I, <laughs> I mean, uh, no, sorry, uh, MB, MB RAM. I didn't know what RAM was, but 546, oh, it seemed like a big thing. And now you're talking of, you know, 15 uh, GB RAM. <laughs> Stuff. Yeah, yeah, now 546 just, will probably happen in a micro microsecond or something like yeah. that. Yeah, so it is. It is kind of. It was a complete leap of faith, uh, like you said, uh, knowing nothing about this and and realizing. And and one of the things that struck me later, which which Ajit actually pointed out at the time, he said, "If we do this, we'll be the first in the world to do it," because there was no standalone news site for the internet. It was all shovelware, as we used to call it. Um, uh, publishing houses, which were in print, uh, pushing their print stuff onto the internet, right? Nobody was yeah. actually creating content for the internet per se, uh, using mm -hmm. things like hyperlinks and and all the all the possibilities of the internet. So, yeah, it was it was completely unknown. Every day you screwed up, and and then you learned and and did something better. Everything evolved. Uh, commentary got stabilized when the lines started getting better. Then we started saying, uh, actually, I remember there was a there was a group of U.S. students who visited us. This was in 98 or 99, 98, I think it was. Uh, and they they came to read of wanting to, to look around and stuff. And they spent some time with Ajit. And at some point, I was called into the room. And um, so I was asking them about how they... Uh, handle, uh, I mean, how in the hell do you sit for an entire day and watch the stream of words, right? Yeah. Uh, and they were telling me stories like, oh, we take it in shifts. So uh, we all sleep in one of the uh, uh, guys' rooms and, and two of us will be reading and the others will sleep and then we wake them up and they watch and all of that. And, and it struck me as odd that you could just sit there and wait for the next batch of words to pop up on your screen with nothing else to do, right? <laughs> so again, we were talking to the techs and saying, can we give these guys something to do? Maybe uh, a chat box or something where people could sort of interact with each other. They could even interact with me and, and stuff. And so we had uh, the, the commentary on the left half and, and a chat box on the right. And uh, um, so, yeah, it was it was basically just learn on the fly. And that, I think, was the exciting part of uh, Read of. You know, as ridiculous as it sounds about uh, uh, people reading chunks of text and then waking the other one up and getting them to read it, it also is a, is a reflection of uh, how people in America were so desperate and hungry for cricket. And so Crickinfo and Rediff and all these other things, when they came along, it was a godsend for them. Yeah, I, I've heard that from a lot of, uh, uh, particularly you guys who... Uh, 
uh, various of you used to be in the U.S. at that time, and and um, I remember uh, friends from Trick and Four and all that telling me about uh, following this over there. And uh, and it's interesting that cricket was the pretty much the leader in this thing before this kind of coverage spread to other sport. Um, I suppose the general, or, I mean, the worldwide audience for cricket is also partly responsible. It's one of those surefire things, right? Uh, cricket actually gave Reed of initially a huge boost because a lot of people came for the cricket coverage and then realized that there was so much more. Um, but yeah, it 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 sort of everything kind of came together uh, without conscious volition. Uh, the love for the sport, the fact that technology permitted uh, these these things, uh, the fact that there was a ready-made audience for it. Anything cricket, anytime, right? I mean, people just... I think a whole lot of people follow me on Twitter still because of what I did in 2000 or something. Uh, not, not because of my politics or uh, any of the other things. Absolutely. So coming to, uh, you know, we've spoken about... Uh the people in Redif themselves, I mean, how the journalists saw it and how the audience saw it. But how did the players and the board and everyone else who were in the cricket sphere, how did they see this whole thing? Did they even pay you guys any attention? Or was you were you seen more like some oddity doing something in some corner of Mumbai? No, actually, and I have to thank the diaspora for the, I mean, we have to thank the diaspora for this. I think, uh, funnily enough, the cricketers caught on to this before uh, the mainstream journalists did, uh, in a manner of speaking. Uh, an example would be, um, say, for instance, the 96 tour of England. Um, yeah. Dravid, uh, Saurav, and all of that, uh, uh, th- th- that particular series. Uh these guys used to, you know how uh, the Indian team is on tour, right? They keep getting invited to uh, the homes of Indians for meals and stuff. Yeah. And they heard about Rediff from these people who were hosting them. Oh, have you read what Rediff said about this inning? So have you read what Rediff said about this other thing and all that? So it was surprisingly, uh, for us at least, it was surprising that actually cricketers reached out to us as opposed to the other uh, way around. Um, immediately after the 96, by then we had started this thing on read of uh, live chats with celebrities. Uh, TN Session kicked it off. Uh, LK Adwani was the second. And the third was Saurav Ganguly. And, oh, wow. Uh, the, the, it was the easiest thing in the world. All we had to do was call Saurav and say, we're calling from this thing called read of. And he's, oh, yeah, I know read of. Uh, what do you need? And we said, uh, how about an internet chat? Uh, will you will you come on live? And uh, and he just said yes, absolutely no questions asked. I think what happened probably was that because the diaspora was consuming cricket um, via read, if at least in '96, uh, it was top of the mind for them. So they would keep bringing it up, and these players kept hearing about it. Uh, more than they were hearing about, say, conventional media, which, you know, these guys had to wait uh, to consume. I suppose it gave us a kind of instant entry and also a kind of, I wouldn't use the word cachet so much as there was goodwill. Uh, the players had considerable goodwill towards us. Um, nobody refused to talk to us. Uh, they reached out to us when... when um, they wanted to talk about something. I think um, there was the uh, one of the most famous uh, examples was uh, when the players were fighting for a contract system. Uh, yeah, they 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 were the ones who told us about it. They were the ones who told us about the problems. People like uh, Kumble, for instance, Dravid, uh, Srinath. Uh, this is where we heard about it for the first time, and it was a very sort of proactive back and forth where the players I, I remember um we had good relations with the australian team in fact with the touring teams because again we were an internet company uh they needed help setting things up in the hotels and stuff and they would call us um so the relationships were very good and, and what about the great embracer of uh, new technology the bcci <laughs> BCCI was a, the BCCI was a whole other story. You know, the funniest story I remember about the BCCI and technology was when, uh, I remember that tour of Australia, a uh, couple of days was the coach. 
Um, yeah. And Tendulkar was the captain. And and that was made famous, by the way, because Lele opened his mouth in an interview. 3-0. <laughs> yeah, 3-0. <laughs> and, and this was to read if, right? <laughs> yeah, this was for Rediff. And yeah. so we had written uh, we had written that story. We said, look, I mean, the BCCI is supposed to be sending the best possible team. What signal is it when the secretary of the BCCI is saying these guys are going to be uh, blind? And uh, Lele promptly denied it because Dalmia told them to deny it. And then they said they'll file a case. And we said, yeah, fine. Uh, we'll see you in court. We'd love to uh, play the recording for you. Um and nothing further was heard about it, by the way. Uh, but uh, I suppose the case still exists in some court somewhere. God knows. But uh, <laughs> the the funniest part was at at that time the players were also uh, lobbying for they wanted a uh, video recording equipment and a computer, uh, a laptop to to sort of review their own um, thing. And so I called up Lele and asked him, uh, you know, the players are asking for this. And Lele, in exasperation, said, if I remember correctly, something like, uh, Are yaar, in logon ko kya kya uh, we've given them a bat, we've given them a ball. Abhi, now they want a video camera. What are they going to do? Make short movies. What? What's going on? Why do they need all this? <laughs> and, and it's so bizarre. They, 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 they just refused to open their minds to anything at all. Uh, the players really had to fight. In fact, Kapil Dev, at his personal expense, bought a video camera uh, to take with him on that tour. And uh, he was the one who was recording practice sessions and then showing it to the players and stuff. It was much later that it, uh, you know, once right and all that came in, pretty much finally figured out that these things were actually important. And it, it, it was bizarre. You couldn't have a conversation with the BCCI about anything at all. If you ask them about the contract system, uh, I, I remember... Uh, again, it was Lele who made this uh, statement. He said, you know, we have a big, big talent pool. So, if ko injured, then what do we do? That's just part of uh, how it is and it's not our business. There, there, there are always other players to replace it. I think, yeah, they, they, they didn't see cricket as something really worth investing in. It is just something to make money off of. A couple of years later, in that famous 2001 series, uh, you know, which is now turning 20 years, there is, uh, I was reading one column of yours where you basically uh, mentioned how, uh, you know, a correspondent of yours in Calcutta was denied entry by Dalmia because apparently you guys had written a strong piece uh, criticizing him about something. And... He said, no, no dot-com journalists allowed. And he just put a blanket ban on there. <laughs> yeah, actually, I mean, there it was directly denied by Dalmia himself. But uh, late 96 onwards, uh, what had happened was that in between series, you had to have uh, some kind of coverage, right? And and uh, at that time, uh, we were in no mood to just do the anodyne stuff. Uh, coincidentally, a copy of the BCCI's annual report fell into my hands. Here's a, here's a funny tidbit, tidbit from that. In, in the year in question, the Delhi District Cricket Association spent 18 lakh on one item of clothing. Can you guess what that item of clothing would have been? <laughs> no. Okay, neckties. <laughs> yeah, these guys, that, that entire thing was, I mean, it, it belonged on the fiction shelves. So we did a series on how the so-called honorary uh, office bearers of the BCCI and its member associations were really milking uh, the sport, right? And we were promptly banned from all stadiums. Uh, an unofficial ban, but a very real ban. Uh, Lele actually told us about it, saying, don't even bother applying because you don't have any tickets. <laughs> um, it, which, which also led to this funny thing when Steve Waugh came uh, visiting uh, War and some of the others wanted to do all sorts of things like, you know, going and seeing Dobi Talao and they wanted to walk through Kamatipura, the, the red light area in Bombay. Yeah. All of that, right? And, and and they dragged us into this. So, uh, imagine escorting Glenn McGrath and and uh, Steve War and all that through the red light district. It was, it was insane. These, these women were uh, shouting all sorts of things. And uh, Steve Waugh would go, oh, what did she say just now? And and you're like, Steve, you don't want to know. <laughs> uh, so uh, so that happened. And, and that practice game against Bombay happened. And somewhere on the sidelines, uh, we met with a couple of the players. And Stephen Bernard was there. And uh, somebody casually asked, one of them casually asked, so we'll see you at the test. And uh, I said, no, you won't. Because uh, we won't be given passes. 
So Steve was like, what are you talking about? And they have these players' passes, right? Yeah. And he promptly went to his room and, and picked up some three, four passes and handed it over and said, uh, we'll see you guys there. So uh, I couldn't I couldn't go to the ground because if you remember those days, you didn't have a dedicated line, right, for each person. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you couldn't hog the one internet line that existed to, to do ball by ball. So I you had, had to, to go to the press center and you had to fire. Yeah. And you had to wait in line and all of that stuff. So ball by ball yeah. was out of the question from the grounds. So I would do it from the Rediff office. Um, Ashish Magotra just joined. And uh, so we gave him a pass and said, listen, you go there. And if you see something interesting, just call it in. We can fold it into our coverage. And journalists, by the way, senior journalists of that time, told Ashish that he couldn't sit in the press box. Ashish had a VIP pass from uh, courtesy uh, the Australians. Uh, so he came back looking fairly dejected and and uh, we lost our cool and Faisal then took Ashish back and uh, we kind of made an issue out of it. Lele came and asked, who gave you passes? And he said, well, the Australians did. So what are you going to do about it? Uh, wow. Something that they would do. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> it, it was it was Bhavka Raja, no? so uh, they could do anything. The funny part was Lele, after all that, he was still very fond of Reed. He, he, he would not only call us proactively to tell us things and then pretend that he had never uh, told it to us and we must have got it from somebody else. Uh, he would actually call and say, Kya, uh, for some days you haven't called what? You don't you don't call me these days and all of that. I remember going for a selection meeting in, uh, which was being held in Baroda in his, his hometown. And the selection uh, meeting was supposed to start at about 11. I reached there slightly early and I found uh, Lele there. So Lele said, ah, chal, bat karte. and he took me into the room where the selection meeting was to be held. And he was holding forth about all sorts of things. So Shivlal Yadav was the chairman of selectors at that time. He pokes his head in and says, uh, Lele sahab, go meeting. And Lele just waved him away and said, uh, can't you see I'm talking to somebody? I'll call you when I'm ready. And that was it. The selectors just 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 walked off. It, it it was feudalism at its best or or worst, which, which is the way you want to look at it. Yeah, I never got this whole uh, uh, thing with. I mean, I I did get it, but it was all so contradictory because every single uh, person in an association in BCCI used to go to Crick Info and read this every day hmm. because they would go and check what was there on it. And they were really desperate that all their players and everyone else gets the maximum coverage. But at the same time, when it came to accreditation, they would always pick up a fuss. Absolutely. Uh, the, the funniest part was after two, three of these uh, stories that we did based on the uh, on, on, on the annual reports and stuff, Dalmia instituted an internal rule that there would be only two copies of this uh, thing. Uh, one would be with him and one would be with the secretary. So... When I learned that, I, I went to the BCCI office and asked for the latest uh, thing. And they said, no, we don't have any. So I called up Lele. And uh, Lele said, uh, I saw there are only two copies. And uh, he said, uh, we'll see. And then one official from the BCCI calls me one day and says, uh, can you come this evening to... There is a seedy little uh, bar just in the lane behind uh, the Taj. Yeah, uh, mostly frequented by uh, gays, particularly during the weekends. Uh, and he called me to that bar, and I go there, and there's this brown envelope. It it felt like something out of a spy movie or something. He passed it to me under the table, and and I open it, and I see the whole uh, thing. Some, uh, I mean, obviously Lele must have done it. Uh, Xerox the whole thing, and 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 sent it across. So the the there was like you said this thing of. They were very aware of what uh, Crick Info was writing and what Rediff was writing and stuff. And and when they wanted to get their point of view across, they would quietly call you for a meeting or whatever and tell you things and say, hey, sub off record, yeah, tum liko, lekin, <laughs> don't don't say where you got it from. But yeah, we got, I'm, I'm sure it was the case with Crick Info as well. We got a lot of our stories from the very people who uh, were part of this whole thing. Uh, do you remember Sunil Dev? Of course, yeah, yeah. So, Delhi. So, Su- yeah. Sunil Dev once uh, uh, called me when I was in Delhi. He said, come over for a meeting and stuff like that. And we sat in his office and we were chatting. And he suddenly tossed in this phrase, uh, one day before, one day after. So, I was like, what the hell is that? 
सो इस बारे तेरे को पता नहीं है सो वॉट यूज टू हैपन अपेरेंटली वॉज दैट सेलेक्टर्स है मैंडेटेड टू गो विद टीम्स and these guys are honorary right so they are only supposed to get expenses yeah so how it works is that if you are working for cricket info i mean if you are working for cricket for the bcci you get to claim a certain amount for the day you are working the day before that and the day after that because the day before that you are preparing for your work and the day after that you are uh, following up and stuff so how these guys used to file their um, uh expense sheets was if it was a test match the day before the test the first day of the test and the day after the test would be one expense so they filed one day before day of the test match uh day after the test match then for the second day they would file one day before one day after <laughs> and and the day of the game so five matches imagine every single uh, day would be, i mean five day matches every single day would be one day before one day after <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 I, I swear I'm not making this up. Lele once submitted an expense uh, sheet, and then some CA kindly pointed out to him that he had expensed about 430 days out of 365. <laughs> so, they, 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 it is. I mean, it's almost beyond belief what is going on in that uh, uh, organization at that time. <laughs> yeah so uh, and and this was also around i mean we're talking 2001 99 this was also around the time when the biggest story broke which was uh, fixing yeah. and you were Absolutely. basically i i remember you used to almost write a daily report if not twice a day updating people about what was happening yeah actually uh, the funny thing is krishna prasad was uh, with us i mean he was he was uh, a colleague at uh, the sunday observer and uh, he had at some point uh, spoken to uh, one of these uh, bookies and from him he had heard stories of fixing dating back into the 80s and all that yeah um, and and uh, he had done a small piece in uh, the sunday observer uh, very broadly skimming the surface the piece was more about how bookies operate as opposed to who was involved with the indian team and all that and then uh, once he joined outlook he and anirudh bahel uh, did that uh, expose big expose and, yeah yeah and after that it became but but a lot of us i, I i'm sure the same case you were working in uh, cricket for at the time where we were correctly uh, all of you guys were that 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 Uh, Stella No I had actually uh, I joined joined a little later so I mixed, missed the whole fixing thing yeah all right um but yeah uh, cricket for was also following that and there were those hearings in south africa right which we were covering live uh, king commission we, yeah yeah the king commission so we had somebody in south africa fax us the uh, actual uh, statements uh, the transcripts uh, day by day and we would use that for our coverage and stuff and yeah it was it was one of those it was one of those times i think it was also in a sense a precursor to what happens today where things are so polarized that whatever you write you get into uh, trouble one way or the other um so because azar's name came up in in some of the reports that we did and we had a lot of people uh calling with threats and stuff uh back in the wow. day wow yeah I, like how dare you uh, write about him and and all of that shit so yeah that is that is one of the i think that was also the moment when i mean i quit full time cricket writing in 2001 uh late 2001 at some point i just had enough um one of the proximate causes was this because see we we report on cricket in good faith right we see what is happening and we say if if the batsman plays a bad stroke a uh, 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 way of processing it is yeah he made a mistake but then you realize that these mistakes are sometimes deliberate there are, there are things that you just can't understand um i remember a game where a uh, one day game where hansi kronia was the captain and the field set was so bizarre uh they just giving runs away for free and <laughs> and, and 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 the match report i wrote about how you just couldn't understand the, how, how how could you give this a uh, particular bowler the uh, the new ball when he was bowling straight flat outside the off stump and he was getting creamed through the off side repeatedly 
And why he wasn't changed? He had an extended spell. Now, you think that these are captains making bad decisions in the heat of the moment? And then when you realize that 90% of what you've written is just BS, there's something else going on uh, behind the scenes. It, it, how the hell do you continue writing with that kind of involvement and passion, right? So there was that, and, and there was also this funny moment. Uh, somebody forwarded me a parody site where, among other things, I mean, that guy was parodying everything and anything, but one of the parodies was a parody of a Prem Panika math report. <laughs> and I read it, okay. and he was bang on accurate. I mean, it was funny, but it was also accurate because, I mean, remember the kind of amount of cricket that used to be played at that time. So you're coming in every single day and doing the same thing over and over again. And we seem to be playing Sri Lanka 10 times a year. Either you were going there or they were coming here and the same people doing the same things to the same people. It, I, I realized that I was phoning it in. I was working off of some kind of internal template and just, just filling in the blanks and stuff. So... I started worrying about what it was doing to my writing and to my love for the game. And so at that point, yeah, I told my editor that I wanted out. Um, but yeah, then we had Faisal and, yeah. Completely get the sentiment. I was pretty much in that phase in 2008 when, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, you had, you know, the, it seems like you had uh, five years and I had a similar five-year stretch. So we probably reached the end of the tether around yeah. the same time in the thing. But I wanted to touch upon one thing. I mean, it's amazing how uh, there's so much of repetition when it comes to technology. I mean, we did speak about how what you were doing back in the late 90s was pretty much what blogging ended up being later and what Twitter ended up being later. The other thing you did, of course, is what we're do now doing as podcasts. But back then you were doing it as internet radio. Can you talk a bit about that? Panic Station was a uh, quite a big yeah. uh, hit back then. Yeah. Uh, 2001 World Cup or something, right? It, it was, again, one of those, you know, spur-of-the-moment things. Uh, at some point, Ajit Balakrishnan wanted to explore the potential of radio. So yeah. they built a very, very tiny studio. I swear, it was, uh, it was claustrophobic almost. Uh, in the space that was available in the Reader of Office and Mahim, and then sprung it on me that I was supposed to do audio commentary. Um, so what I had to do was sit and look at the screen with the volume off and just call the play. And it was bizarre because just like with the written uh, thing, where I went into it without much of an idea of what it involved. I mean, if you think about writing 20, 30 words per ball across a game, that's 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 a novel um and and you come back and do it again the next day and then you do your maths report and then you do columns and stuff right the same thing with with audio commentary you realize that you were stuck you couldn't even go take a leak when you wanted to uh and and i think one of the funny things was there was this uh, associate nation that played i forget which one it was but what i do remember is i hadn't seen any of them play I didn't know their names. I didn't know. I mean, you had the scoreboard, so you knew the names. But these guys are under the helmets. I had no way of recognizing them. So the commentary for that particular game was something on the lines of, uh, you know, Anil Kumble bowls and the batsman plays it to cover because I I, I didn't know who the batsman was. <laughs> <laughs> and I got slammed for that. But it was fun in the sense that what we did, which worked, was we had this... Uh, Thing where readers could submit questions and as soon as lunch was called I, I was given a five minute break to use the washroom and stuff and then we did this question and answer thing so there was Mahesh uh, and there was Krishna Prasad and me and I think we used the soundtrack of one of those Tamil uh, there's a movie called Dhul I think okay uh, yeah Dhul uh, at that time there was there, there was this catchy little uh, Kutta number in that and we used the opening soundtrack of that and it was fun it was just all kinds of questions would come in and we would uh, we would respond um and it was it was humorous it was lighthearted uh we created several of these standing jokes mahesh was always late he would he would come in five minutes later so people started uh, writing in and saying i have a question but please wait till mahesh comes back because i want to hear mahesh reading the question and things. It was it was huge fun. Except it was incredibly tiring just sitting there. And after that, having to write a maths report, I, I realized that this is not something that 
that we wanted to do for keeps mercifully what happened was that uh, it didn't fly with the advertisers at that time so uh, so that experiment ended after one world cup yeah i think it might probably was the uh, mini world cup right the world, yeah the uh, small yeah 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 the, what became the champions trophy after Correct. that yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah so you left full time cricket writing but then you know blogging basically got came in and then uh, you took pretty much naturally to blogging almost uh, you know without too much of a break i think by 2002 or 2003 you were already blogging on quite a regular basis and uh, you, you know cricket was still very much part of your daily you know life yeah yeah it was because uh, by then i was in the us and willow tv had just started out um so they needed uh, i mean they uh, so the guys who founded willow tv reached out to me and said listen uh, for this first series we'll give you a, a complimentary sort of entry uh, could you use the service and tell us what you think and all that and there was much to love about uh, uh willow because if you remember their video was connected to their scoreboard so you could click on a batsman and see his uh play or you could click on wickets and just see the wickets again um and and i think blogging in a sense the 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 catalyst was that when you're watching a match you've done the same thing so you know about this we take extensive notes right it's not just sit back after the match and try and recall things you're taking notes in the moment um and when you write the match report then it's a question of what are you leaving out and there were so many of these little things that used to catch your attention at the time in the moment which you never used um so the blog became a way of maybe using some of these things to make little points or or, or to capture a little moment and stuff like that and and it was it didn't it didn't feel as pressurizing as having to do ball by ball for an entire match i think the difference uh between say what i had to do for readif and what you guys did in cricket info was you had people doing it in shifts um, yeah. so uh, so either a session or an hour or whatever i had to do it entirely uh start to finish so you literally were captive in front of the screen you, you I, I, one of the things i learned at that time was never what to drink coffee because then you would want to use the washroom uh yeah <laughs> so yeah so so uh, coffee was out what the drinking water was out all of that and and uh, blogging became i think a way of staying in touch with the game more or less but only doing what you wanted to do as opposed to what you were expected to do you didn't have to do match reports and i think the the moment that it became a tipping point was when i started doing these threads which kind of foreshadowed what happens on twitter these days where i would just say day one session one and open up the comments and i'd keep posting on that and at the same time there would be people commenting and i would bring the comment back into the blog and respond to it and and stuff it was it was huge fun i think what helped was that india abroad had a much more relaxed sort of production schedule um we used to get very busy on uh, fridays and saturdays when the uh, edition went to bed but the rest of the time it it didn't matter and if the game was happening at some other uh, time zone it, it it was fine you watched uh, the fact that i had access to willow tv meant that uh, tunku uh, vardrajan would sometimes come home and sit and watch uh with me and uh, i think shashi tharoor came a couple of times uh home uh, he loved curd rice so my wife had to make curd rice for him <laughs> um and 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 he would sit and watch the match and stuff so uh yeah it was it was it was a change of pace and i think it was a way of you know doing uh, say the kind of thing that you were doing again to go back to that to, take little moments and write about them as opposed to writing about entire matches and stuff yeah and i think the one of the biggest uh, you know things about blogging is that uh, if if there was a game that you saw and that uh, you know left you with left you cold and uh, gave you no inspiration you didn't have to write about it. and, and exactly. uh, you know that but that is not an option you have as a full time writer you have to still 
pull out that thousand whatever number of words to write something about it even on a dead day yeah and 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 you had to uh, you had to make something of it right i mean there was the there was the expectation of your uh, of the institution you were working with they wouldn't let you just phone it in and i mean imagine doing a match report on that bloody sri lanka series where mahanama and uh, uh, this guy <laughs> jay surya <laughs> yes jay surya but I, I i did ball by ball on that one man and, and, and every bloody ball was oh bowled outside the off stump driven through covers four run bowled outside the off stump <laughs> cut through point four runs I mean, for two days <laughs> and then you do a match report and and yeah i think yeah i i talked about proximate causes for leaving uh cricket writing i think this was also equally important that that particular series and that yeah. particular match though though that just match happened in 1997 frame you hung out yeah, for four more years but 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 it was there right i mean it's like one of those things that haunt you for a lifetime <laughs> you went the way uh, you went home and you woke up next morning and you're like oh shit i have to go and watch these two guys bat again <laughs> yeah in my head jaisuri is still batting <laughs> yeah it it's it's one of those nightmares you don't easily recover from and and <laughs> yeah so which which brings me from blogging to twitter and it almost then around the, the mid 2000s and late 2000s it almost became like uh you know the two screens you had one screen where you watched the game and then you had another screen where you interacted with the game i mean just like it would have been for the us guys in the late 90s with readif but now this was a much larger population of people getting used to that second screen uh through and through yeah i remember when twitter was launched and and uh somebody from the us sent me i think it was there was some kind of invitation business i'm not very sure about it but somebody from the us sent me the link and said uh, can you try this out and see what happens and and i i just come back to uh, india at the time and uh, i logged in and i didn't see the point initially uh, what was i going to do with this thing and i think what 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 showed me the possibilities was when 2611 happened um, part of the time i was uh, Uh, part of the time i was at the desk collating reports and and rewriting them into a cohesive narrative and part of the time i was covering it live um first at the oberoi and then at the tads and i initially uh, i remember what happened was you couldn't just keep calling right for every little thing so we needed a means of sending information very quickly back to the desk so i suddenly remember twitter and i told the guys at the desk listen just just uh, log in and follow me on twitter and i'll just keep typing as i see things so you have that and then you can cut paste and and do whatever you want with it and so i was doing it primarily as a means of communicating with the office but suddenly the following exploded from from about a couple of dozen to i think over 2000 in the course of two days um and that kind of woke me up to the possibilities i think of of instantaneous communication of unfettered communication if you will because you could it was not on your uh, home platform so you could pretty much say what you wanted it was your private space uh that combination and the fact that you had immediate responses uh that i think was was a kind of tipping point and then like so many uh, others and and also the the collegiality of it right you got to watch a match and at the same time you got to interact with a whole lot of people who were also watching the match and who had opinions and so there were all you cricket writers were there but also a lot of cricket fans with a lot of interesting things to say which sometimes didn't even occur to you so yeah that became a huge uh, thing it, i i still use it occasionally uh, for 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 mostly test matches over the last 10 years or uh, definitely over the last 5 years what i have noticed is that uh, the amount of uh, uh, cricket writers la- many of them largely amateur who are coming up with a uh, spectacular insight uh, you know in terms of uh, numbers and data and uh, analysis i mean it's just uh, changing cricket writing and i'm i think in the next 5 years you could see a sea change in the way cricket is reported and written about right 
Totally. And and data is, a, is an important component because now increasingly you have tremendous access to data, right? And and and, and the amount of data is also exploded. Uh, I think Kartikeya does a lot of that uh, work. Rajesh yeah, Kartikeya does a lot of that. Uh, Kartik yeah. Krishnaswamy from exactly. Info and Siddharth Monga, all those guys. I mean, the, the way in which they they even watch the game and describe it is uh, going undergoing a sea change yeah and and uh, it's 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 a good thing i think because this uh, symbiotic relationship between the player and the uh, media was to my mind one of the things that was spoiling now uh, cricket coverage uh, break that that uh, umbilical cord and and i think like you said, I mean, you you mentioned five years. I hope it doesn't take five years because this this has happened. It's not even a, an evolving thing. Uh, players going directly to uh, their fan base is very much a thing now. And and I think uh, even before Ashwin, remember uh, Chahal used to do those funny. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Chahal TV. Yeah, yeah, and 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 he used to get a lot of following for that. So. Players will figure it out uh, pretty much. And and the way Ashwin has succeeded with this will interest more and more players. And uh, this will become a thing. Yeah, I so, wonder if uh, they'll, we'll soon see. I mean, I, I don't know. I doubt it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it'll be nice if uh, the players can have some version of a player's tribune, you know. Maybe not necessarily in print, but even if it can be online, if it can be... Players telling us their own stories in honest, uh, truthful ways, without uh, the journalists having. I mean, of course, the, uh, the uh, there can be a, an editor who can put things together in an editorial sense, but there doesn't need to be any uh, input from anyone. That'll be something that'll be interesting to see for from all the players. Yeah. and 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 it could happen organically, right? Because one of the things is the players guaranteed an audience, one, and mm. brands are going to want to buy into that whole thing. So imagine, for instance, the value of, let's say, Virat Kohli doing a video series called Captain's Corner or whatever, where he talks yeah. about uh, the 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 game as he see, saw it and and the various moments and stuff. If he starts doing that, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be an easy sell for his his managers. Uh, there'll be brands lining up. I, I wouldn't be very surprised if Ashwin gets uh, sponsored for his videos fairly soon. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope it happens, actually, because, like you said, the press conference is a complete waste. It's like, uh, oh, you know, we have to execute the Yorker. I've never understood how you execute a Yorker. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we have to, uh, you know, we just have to stick with our processes and, and we have to execute our plans and uh, we have to rely on our skill sets. It's, it's that coach speak has become, you tune off, really. So maybe doing it on their own will, will give them that freedom as well. And there will be a commercial element coming in. And once that comes in, it will explode. So could be good times. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, if uh, uh, do you uh, specifically, I know, I know that, uh, you know, you always say that you quit full time cricket writing long back and have no intention of going in there. But do you, uh, what do you see, especially in the technology space that gives you uh, the most hope in terms of cricket and writing and coverage and, uh, you know, etc.? The fact that there are so many different ways you can do it. Look, uh, we, we, we keep using the word writing. But today you can cover a cricket match or you can be part of a cricket match or, or you can be a cricket journalist in so many different ways, right? Uh, you could do uh, live blogs. You can do uh, podcasts like you're doing. Um, you can do... Clubhouse. Uh, <laughs> Clubhouse, yes, exactly. I was coming to that. The, you can do Twitter threads. And and start conversations. You can do clubhouse where you uh, it, it it takes you back to those days when you actually enjoyed cricket in two ways. One is the game itself, and one is the company. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, there was a recent uh, episode of uh, Clubhouse. I think it was way past your bedtime. Sit uh, where Jared Kimber was on, and I was on, and Chandresh was on, and the discussion was fabulous. Because there were so many different perspectives, there were a couple of uh, uh, 
folks from England uh, who joined in and who had a very different perspective from, say, that of an Indian fan about what was happening in in uh, Ahmedabad. Uh, that's that's all of these are going to be uh, new things, and uh, that is given. I remember back in the day when when Ajit was trying to convince us about why we should be on the internet. He said, "Think of it this way: think of." the fact that when you're working in a newspaper, your 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 view is restricted uh, or you're looking through a window. And he said the size of the window depended on the, on the kind of media it was. The way he explained it was he said, suppose you're working for a national paper, the nation is your, is your beat, and that's all. Uh, now, if you're working for a city paper, like we were working for Midday, for instance, what happens in the rest of the country is secondary to what is news for that particular uh, audience, which is which is Mumbai city, primarily. Uh, he said the internet, on the other hand, is suppose I were to take you blindfolded to the middle of the desert and remove the blindfold and leave you there. It's it's wide and vast and and open on all sides and and the only limitation on you is your own imagination, right? If you can think it, you can do it. He said, that's, that's what the internet will do for you and that's why you should be on it. And I'm thinking, yeah, that, that, that's coming true now. I mean, as a cricket journalist, it's, it's entirely my call how I want to, uh, want to interact with the game. I might not want to write at all. I might just want to hang in clubhouse uh, while the match is on. Or I might just want to do a Twitter thread or a combination of both. Or at the end of it, if I think that there is something that I want to say at greater length, I could again do a podcast, or I could I could write, or I could do a video, uh, talk to camera kind of thing on video. The sky is the limit. But uh, I also want to bring in uh, you know the flip side. We have seen uh, the perils of. Uh, technology and social media in aspects uh, outside cricket especially in the political arena do you does, do you also have a sense of worry that uh, ultimately the obsession to control the message and also with the uh, extreme levels of partisanship and uh, and also politics uh, inc- uh, you know politics of course has always played a part in cricket but now politics increasingly also getting in do you also worry in a sense of how cricket and tech could the relationship could work out? Not worry too much because uh, this is not even the new era, right? I mean, the reason why we stopped uh, that chat uh, interface along with the commentary was because people started spamming it and people okay. started uh, being abusive on it. And uh, it, it, it was a nightmare for a bit because somebody would come in and abuse. All you needed was an email account, right? So... Uh, you got an email account and you signed in and you could you could say whatever you wanted. And if you banned that email account, they came right back with another email account. And uh, so so this this kind of thing uh, of of people for want of a trolling yeah. mis- trolling, misbehaving, all of that has has been going on from um say the late 90s onwards, in my experience at least. Uh, I don't worry too much about it because what I do worry about is that it will create and reinforce bubbles. Um, people who don't disagree with you are not following you or or stop following you. So that that avenue of persuasion or even discussion for that matter, a, a kind of meeting of the minds where maybe at the end of it, you agree to disagree, but at least there is that dialogue. And I think what is happening and what will increasingly happen is that there will be be separate sort of spaces, spaces for people who think one way and spaces for people who think another way. And these two spaces will not really talk to one another. At best, they will troll each other, but not not really have a conversation. And that you see, like you pointed out, you see it in the political sphere, definitely. And to an extent, I think you're also seeing it in the cricket sphere, for instance. I mean, you might honestly want to do a piece in whatever medium, podcast or writing or, or video or whatever, which talks about, say, Kohli's latest innings as not being, it was valuable from a team point of view, but it was not vintage Kohli. He had to struggle. He had to be human. And you say that from a from a clear-eyed reading of what you saw when he was playing, 
But to say something like that then becomes, how dare you talk about Kohli like this? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah and, and either you get a lot of abuse or the person sort of stops uh, listening to you or following you or whatever. They don't look to engage with you and see if, why do you feel that way? Why, they don't ask the question, that basic question, why do you think that? Could, could it also be this? There is no dialogue. And increasingly, I think that will, will happen. Will that impact the way we interact with cricket? No, we'll continue to impact. Uh, I mean, we'll continue to interact with the game in the way that we know how, which is based as much on us as it is on 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 what is happening in the game itself, right? Our sense of values, our sense of aesthetic, uh, our sense of the sport and what it means. All of that will continue to dictate. It's just that we'll probably end up speaking to a like-minded audience and not necessarily to a uh, a wider uh, audience that also includes people who disagree. Great, Prem. I think I've taken a lot of your time, but this was uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for all your lovely anecdotes and memories. Uh, not at all, yeah. It's a complete pleasure. It's been a long time since we chatted. So, uh, <laughs> basically, our interactions have been, again, new media, Twitter, and all of that. But yeah, this is this is huge fun. One of these days, I'm going to reverse this. And on this podcast, I'm going to be the one asking you questions because uh, you had that. Uh, I mean, you were again involved with cricket at a, at a fairly seminal moment, right? The aftermath of match fixing and then the the uh, the Ganguly years, for instance. Yeah, uh, I think the seminal moment for me was the Chapel Ganguly years. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's uh, we'll do that one of these days. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Prem and I are also on Clubhouse, so you can follow us and we'll end up doing quite a few chats there, maybe during uh, games. So, yeah, happy to chat anytime and uh, great fun, Prem. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Take care. That brings us to the end of another episode of the 81 All Out podcast. If you enjoy the work we do, please support us via coffee.com. That's K O hyphen F I dot com slash 81 all out you can find the link in the show notes and it'll allow you to either set up a recurring monthly payment or throw in a one-time contribution also please subscribe on itunes spotify google podcasts or wherever else you prefer it would be great if you could leave a rating and a review so that more people can find us as always we would love to hear your thoughts on the work we do so please send us your feedback 